Well, I tell you, we've been looking for that hot fishing. It seems to take place in some of the coldest water. We went back to Essexville, Harlow's on the Bay with Joe Harlow, headed out towards the hot pond that seemed to have a lot of ice blown in from the northeasterly wind. I tell you, it was chilly. We knew there were some big fish waiting. They were getting limit catches of walleye, some steelhead. We thought we'd make an adventure out of it. We did. Part two of the Hot Pond coming up in just a minute. Stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. Time for Michigan Outdoors. Last week, we had so much fun fishing the hot pond at Consumers Power Plant in Saginaw, we wanted to return to see if we couldn't catch some walleyes. We asked permission to drive on the dike to reach the open water since the northeasterly wind had driven ice into the canal. But Consumers Power told us if we were caught setting foot on their land, we'd be arrested. And no, I'm not kidding. Despite the fact that the wind had been changing the water levels and causing the ice to break up along the shore, Consumers Power said that fishermen were going to be arrested if they were caught walking on consumers' land. Well, that floored us. Why would consumers go out of their way to make it difficult to fish the waters near their plant that attract so many fish? Well, we've been digging into that question, and although we haven't been given a straight answer by Consumers Power, we have been finding out a lot of interesting facts about this generating plant and the hot water it discharges. Got this information from the DNR. Needless to say, on this day, we stayed on the ice and the lower rocks as much as we could, despite the fact that going was treacherous. I don't think we were putting ourselves in any great danger. But like many worthwhile outdoor experiences, we were wending our way through some difficult terrain in order to reach our fishing hole. The reason all of this water here isn't frozen is because of the power plant. Consumers' power diverts a part of the Saginaw River behind the plant through some canals, uses the water to cool its generators, then pumps it back into Saginaw Bay about 17 to 18 degrees warmer than it was. When the winds are from the west or the south, the warm water flows around the point, melts the ice towards the public boat launch at Harlow's on the Bay. But recently, the northern winds have blown the ice in, which is why we have the ice jams right now. But up in the canal, known as the hot pond, the water is warm, and every year seems to attract more and more fish. In the late 70s, carp and catfish were about the only species here, but today you find all kinds of game fish, big ones and in good numbers. That's why we and a lot of other anglers go through so much to fish here. Threading the line through my casting rod isn't easy today. The wind chill is at least 25 below, and we all try to keep our gloves on as much as possible. One thing, it's quiet out here, except for the purr of our outboard motors and the whistle of the wind, all the crunching of the icebergs, and the sound of our exposed flesh turning solid. There's not much noise at this time of year in Saginaw Bay. Eagle? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That big dark form on the edge of the ice is a winter resident here. It's a bald eagle. In fact, it's a mature eagle, probably five or more years old. You can tell because it has the white head. Eagles are fish eaters, and they only go far enough south in the winter to find open water where they can grab their favorite meals of fish every day. It's always a thrill to see these big birds. They don't like you to get too close, but they do hang around close enough so that you can get some telephoto pictures of them. Another common sight at this time of year is the merganser, or fish duck. More than any other species of waterfowl, mergansers dine on fish, and what better place to spend the winter than at the hot pond? There's a classic merganser profile with a bright red beak and feet now, if you're a bird watcher, we're told that you're welcome to drive onto the consumer's power property to watch or photograph the birds. Consumer's yeah. personnel even escort bird watchers to areas where most birds are found. It's only the fishermen that are discouraged or arrested for trespassing. Now, we're trolling the first part of the channel here with hot and tots. And just watch. See my rod tip twitch? What's happening is that we're trolling over a huge school of carp so thick that my lure catches on their backs and fins. But you never know when it's a walleye or a steelhead grabbing the lure. 
It's not going to be weeds on the bottom. This hot water sterilizes most of the plant and animal life for a 2,000 to 5,000 acre area. Aside from fish seeking comfort, very little other marine life inhabits the hot pond. To head upstream where the fishing is usually best, we have to jump the cable. Dangerous? Well, not really. Thousands of fishermen do this every year. We've done it many times, and it's the only way to fish these waters that are navigable, connected to Saginaw Bay, and contain our native Michigan fish, many of them planted by the DNR using sportsmen's monies. Right. What does Consumers Power say about this? We well, see that truck up there? That's one of the consumer's security guards. It's his job to keep fishermen off the land. He or somebody from Consumers is always watching when boats cross, and it's been this way for years. Joe Harlow always waves to the Consumers employees who often ask us how fishing is. The employees are friendly enough. It's too bad their home company doesn't allow them to fish the hot pond even on their time off. They see lots of big ones taken year round. This hot water is something. Attracts fish specifically because of the temperature. And without much food there, they're always hungry. Our first fish of the day, Joe Harlow lands a nice largemouth bass. It's out of season, so we toss it back. But other anglers are lucky with the steelhead. Here's a nice one that's a good start towards the limit. But we were really after walleye, and Tim Farragon from Langsburg caught the first one fishing with Bob Garner. Bob picked one up a little later, and for about an hour, the northern pike went on the feed. We saw this one caught by our steelheader friends, and Joe Harlow caught one, too. My claim to fame? Well, same as last week. I was the king of the whistling salmon, the buglemouth trout, otherwise known as a carp. And I caught some dandies. This one here is my biggest. I didn't hook it directly. My lure caught on the line from another lure that was snagged in its tail, which both of them came loose in the net. But what a day. We braved the wind and ice and snow and cold. We managed to escape getting arrested, and we found the hot ponds do have a real cold side in Michigan outdoors. The hot pond attracting a lot of fish, a lot of fishermen, and becoming a hotbed of controversy even in the middle of the winter. Bob Garner's commentary coming up. Tuesday night, the East Lansing City Council passed a watered-down version of an anti-handgun ordinance which had been proposed several months ago. The city will require all new handguns registered to city residents by the state of Michigan to be re-registered by the city. Well, I'm a handgun owner in the city of East Lansing, and I'm kind of rankled now when I think about paying my taxes. I'm also a fisherman at the Hot Ponds in Saginaw. I'm getting a bit rankled when it comes time to pay my consumer's bill. Bob Garner has some comments. Most sportsmen I've talked to are surprised that Consumers Power tries to make it so tough for fishermen to fish the hot pond at Essexville. Other Consumers Power facilities such as Tippy Dam on the Manistee River and Foot Dam on the Osable are wide open and they're free for fishermen to try their luck. But it's a different story at the hot pond. There we've heard the excuse that liability is the problem, but we've also heard that it's plant security. But we've heard nothing from consumers' legal staff. Is liability the problem? If it is, why does consumers allow bird watchers into the plant site but makes it so hard for fishermen? The same question holds true for plant security. Another question I'd like the answer to is why did consumers put a cable across the entry to the pond but doesn't appear to care about fishermen that cross it? If they do care that fishermen cross it, they should stretch it tighter. If they don't care, they should take it down. According to DNR Fish Division, consumers kills a lot of fish at their plant on the hot pond. They also add some chlorine to Saginaw Bay. Could it be that that's the reason for wanting to keep fishermen away? I don't know. Could it be that the cable across the water makes consumers more liable? And is the cable even legal? The, there are other unanswered questions I'd like to ask consumers power and will in the next several weeks. But until these questions are answered by consumers power or the state, Thousands of anglers like myself will just have to remain in the dark. What a week it's been. 
controversy on our fishing, <laughs> hot week in the news. What the heck, Bob? Let's take on some hot questions in there in our mailbag. That is hot, too. This one right here. Larry Mayberg of North Branch, Michigan, uh, writes, and he says, on a show last year, you said you wouldn't show hunting fur-bearing animals because you don't eat the meat. If that's the case, why did you have a show on trapping? Trappers don't eat the meat of the animals they trap. I beg your pardon, Larry. Many of them do. A lot of people eat the, well, they eat raccoons, opossum. Uh, these are the, and the rodents like muskrats and Beavers. beaver, and they're good to eat. Everybody draws the line somewhere. I mean, trapping is a great American heritage, and I believe in it, and I think that it's a, it's a part of America, and it should be continued. But as far as television goes, I draw the line at predator hunting, where the prey is cats and dogs, you know, foxes, coyotes, and, and the cats. So many people have these animals for pets. They're not desired as food, and I'm just going to draw the line there and not get into that yeah, aspect so of it. what show on TV, but you don't have any problem with no, hunting. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that the hunting is one way or the other. I'm saying I'm not going to put it on television. Okay, another letter, too. This one's the toughest one of all, though. Ken Roberts of Lloydminster, Saskatchewan. He writes, he says, I'm really interested in fishing, but this summer I only caught eight fish, and I caught those in one weekend. When you're fishing in a boat, how long do you usually have to wait between each time you catch a fish? I'm not sure my fishing record is too much better than Ken's. Sometimes we wait a long time, and sometimes it's hot and heavy. You've got to keep trying, Ken. Remember, a bad day of fishing is still better than a good day at work most of the time. All of the time. I, that's right. Let's see if you folks can answer this question now in our outdoor quiz. Which white-tailed buck shed their antlers first, the smaller deer or the ones with the bigger racks? Bucks that experience the most mating activity lose their antlers first due to their hormonal levels. Generally, it's the big dominant bucks that do much of the mating and consequently drop their antlers earlier than the smaller bucks. The Central Michigan Sports Show this past weekend in Lansing was quite an event. It's only the third year for this show, but it's grown by leaps and bounds. You could find a little bit of everything there. Sailboats, fishing boats, guides, outfitters, equipment, fishing tackle, and especially crowds. They were interested in the exhibits and attractions, including the trout pond where kids could find some easy fishing and take home a trout or two. Plenty of fishing tackle. But we found lots of interest in the specialized tackle we demonstrated in our Outdoors Forever seminars. Someone who's had a stroke or they're, they're quadriplegic, they can't grip for any great length of time. How are you going to hold the fishing rod? So this is uh, simply a vice with foam padding. You put your hand in there. You can screw it, tighten it or loosen it to make it comfortable for your hand. And that secures the rod for you. And then you can go ahead, and if you have your other hand free, sometimes sure. if someone has a head of Catherine Mulhaupt and Roger McCarville found that our first public appearance with Outdoors Forever was a huge success. We drew good-sized crowds in our seminars, but we weren't just talking about handicapper equipment. We found our so-called handicapper tackle can be used by everyone. And as the guy said that invented this and is making it for kids, you put your child in the boat, you're going out fishing, he gets one, you got to reach around and hold it. With this thing here, you don't have to. He can sit and play it all in. I mean, that's just plain not a bad idea that you might want to consider for a lot of people. You know, you don't have to be handicapped to use this, and I'm sure there are times maybe you're steering the boat. Just say you want to go out fishing by yourself, fish for salmon or brown trout. How are you going to handle the rod and turn the boat? You could do it. Put that on, and then if you want a little relief, set it down there and steer the boat. Frank, steer, you can do it. Here's something that a handicapper came up with that is going to turn on a lot of people's minds to, hey, I think I'll get one of those. I have another use for it. That royal the ideas were flowing with Outdoors Forever, and people enjoyed our big screen TV tapes of some of our recent adventures. If Roger McCarville can get out steelheading, anybody can, and that's the point we're trying to get across. Too many sportsmen drop out, some because of age, the outdoors is too strenuous, some because of an accident, and not necessarily a long-term accident either. But to get the word out and get people active, no matter what their condition, we have a plan. You got your insurance or a court we're starting local chapters. And these are real easy maintenance local chapters. Any of you in this room could be a local coordinator and start a group. 
It could be in, in the office where you work. It could be with the church. It could be a service club. It could be a part of a service club. You could have a Kiwanis Outdoors Forever group. You could have the, the Shift One Employees at Fisher Body Outdoors Forever group. Uh, what was the response? Outstanding. We have a number of volunteers who want to start local Outdoors Forever chapters, and we're laying the groundwork now. It's not just handicappers. A lot of people see the importance of what we're doing. If I were to lose a limb, why, why should I be able to quit hunting, quit fishing, doing the things that I enjoy to do outside? So it, it makes sense to me to try to help to get it accessible to somebody else. Simple. Very simple. Outdoors Forever, a unique approach to hunting and fishing insurance, an idea that's so simple, but whose time has come. Charlie Cleaver from Roseville sent us a recipe for small game goulash. You can use it with rabbit or pheasant. Anything, oh, egg, small let game. Let me tell you, this is a number one oh. top drawer, spectacular. I'm gonna, st I'm gonna eat it. <laughs> I usually don't like to talk with my mouth full, but oh, look at that, that rabbit. Oh, that look at fused. the pieces here. You just cut off little pieces, and they're kind of almost like nuggets is what you're gonna cut off, just little tiny chunks. You don't wanna use the whole leg. You, whole take, a, you take a rabbit like that, or a pheasant, but especially rabbit. This is, we're eating rabbit right now. Oh yeah, you can't beat it. You're gonna make a seasoning here, that a batter that would be perfect for just about anything you ever want to fry. It's got flour, seasoning, salt. You got a whole tablespoon of seasoning salt. Mm -hmm. You can taste the spiciness in you this. You sure can. See the paprika there. And it's got onion salt. So it does have quite a bit of onion salt in it. Now you could use onion powder here, but he says onion salt. Hmm. Like I said, this would make a perfect batter for fish, for just about anything. And instead of salt here, he did use garlic powder. It's very, very fine. Just ground up real fine here. Mm -hmm. Dehydrated. You would probably use fresh garlic, smash oh, it. Oh, sure you could. Chop it up. But you definitely want to stir it up good then. And a whole tablespoon of pepper. Oh, and no it sounds like I a like lot. This. <laughs> That's right. Sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. It's just excellent. There is your batter right there. And like I say, you could be used for anything. You're going to melt two tablespoons of butter, and you're going to fry your little chunks after you dip them in. You want to coat them real good here. I want to make sure they're, every little piece is coated. And it doesn't take a whole lot of time. And then you can fry just those little chunks, just like that. And we snitched some of those. <laughs> right out of the pan. Right out of the pan, and they were just delectable. Oh yeah, you could have went just like that with uh, it. And I was kind of worried at that point, do we really want to take this recipe any farther? <laughs> Look at those. That would be a great way to fix small game McNuggets. Oh, anything, just about anything. And he says add a can of mushroom soup, and you don't add any milk or anything to this, just the soup. And you could stir it on to these little pieces. And he said put in a different pan. We use the same pan here. Yeah, and that worked out fine. Oh, it sure did. It didn't look like that there would be uh, enough sauce there, but after it cooked down, there we go. What do you think, Bob? You finished your plate I think in Charlie time. Cleaver, <laughs> with this recipe, ought to, he gets my Charlie nomination Cleaver. for Time Magazine's Man of the Year Award. Well, I tell this you, is the most oh. phenomenal thing he's done. It's the best recipe of any wild game I've ever eaten. It's you know why tender. it wasn't a winner in our contest? Why it didn't make the, the finals? Because soup. it is too simple. Mm -hmm. It had soup in it. It's too simple. Usually I don't eat. Freddie, so Freddie, I don't like to talk with so my mouth tender. full. <laughs> Freddie, I have to the, guard this it from is, Garner. It is the best recipe that I have ever tasted in my life, wild game or no. Yeah, Isn't you, it? Could, you could use that on anything. It's just perfect. Chicken, it'd be great. I'm going to eat. You folks get outdoors this weekend. It's a great place to be. We'll see you next week. Now, I kid you not, folks. This recipe is absolutely everything we said, and it's so simple, it's almost a crime. You can find it in the current issue of the Outdoor Digest, along with articles on hunting, fishing, and shooting, the Outdoors Forever supplement that shows why this new concept is becoming so popular. Bob picked one up a little later, and for about an hour, the northern pike went on the feed. We saw this one caught by our steelheader friends, and Joe Harlow caught one, too. My claim to fame? Well, same as last week. I was the king of the whistling salmon the buglemouth trout, otherwise known as a carp. And I caught some dandies. This one here is my biggest. I didn't hook it directly. My lure caught on the line from another lure that was snagged in its tail, which both of them came loose in the net. But what a day. We braved the wind and ice and snow and cold. We managed to escape getting arrested. And we found the hot ponds do have a real cold side in Michigan outdoors.